breaches. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Back by popular demand is today's guest, Dr. Hans Deal, and he's going to talk a little bit about really lifestyle medicine and how the CHIP program started. Please welcome him back. Hi, Dr. Deal. It's so great to see you. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving in, in the blue zone that you live in? Oh, uh, we did, but <laughs> we had some unusual crowding events there. I mean, we felt almost uh, dislodged from Loma Linda as a people here. I mean, they were flying in from everywhere. They were coming in from everywhere in the country. What do you mean? <laughs> well, you know, people came to me and said, well, I thought flying was out of, uh, you know, it's, it's not out. It's out right now, isn't it? No, no, well, no, for, no, no, no. Yeah, for a lot of people. people. That's for people. The, the ones who are flying in were turkeys. I mean, turkeys everywhere because they all knew that Loma Linda is sort of the capital of vegetarianism. And they all thought they were safe at Thanksgiving time being in Loma Linda where they're vegetarians. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so that was Loma Linda <laughs> on Thanksgiving. <laughs> What's it like living in a blue zone? Were, were you ever part of any of the, like part of the, the Adventist health study that was so famous? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a small town of about 25,000 people. Uh, many of them are uh, graduate students, doctoral students here, about 5,000. Um, but most of the people, uh, more than half of the people are actually are vegetarians. And so uh, you see a lot of people uh, uh, walking and jogging. And uh, when the gym was open, they were always crowding the gym out. Uh, so it's a very, very uh, active uh, town. It's a lovely town surrounded by mountains. Uh, uh, it's just very ideal climate and uh, we feel very lucky being here. You know, I was watching a, a broadcast, I don't know exactly when it was done, that you were on a, a television show with Dr. John McDougall, and he had nothing but praise for you. He said that you help have more people than just about anybody else through your CHIP program. That was very nice to hear that from him. So I paid, I paid him a lot for that. I think he was very sincere in it, though, because he helps <laughs> no. a lot of people, too. No. But, but I think people, the chip has changed a bit because first it's, it stood for complete. Wait, no, now it's complete health improvement program. But back in the day when I met you, it was. Tell me about the difference in the name. Well, we started with the coronary health improvement program because we thought we might be able to do something for heart disease. And as we began to help people with heart disease, all of a sudden the diabetes came down, the blood pressure came down, their weight fell off. And we said, really, this is more than just taking care of heart disease. This is an overall uh, fairly uh, inclusive uh, uh, health program for various chronic diseases. So it was quite a, a change in our thinking. We didn't know that it would have so many positive uh, uh, benefits. Well, you, you founded this program, I believe it was something like 35 years ago. You now have over 100,000 graduates worldwide. And yesterday I was watching a webinar with our friend, Dr. Sal, and he had three of your graduates on that had spectacular improvements of health, decrease in weight. Must feel very good to have helped so many people. But did you see that? Yes. Yeah, I watched it live yesterday. Our mutual friend Brenda well, Morris was on, and I remember her from before. She looked amazing. These are these could have been your your uh, participants, your uh, uh, mentees that you were mentoring. Uh, you know, these three people that lost each about 120 pounds in two to three to four years. And uh, when they asked, uh, uh, "How did you lose that weight?" They said, "Well, Doctor Deal told us to eat more." but of the right foods, right? Like fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lots of beans, drink lots of water and just be a, you know, get involved in an exercise program and uh, focus on some good things in life. How did you get the idea to start this program? How did it become a worldwide program? Well, you know, it goes back to Nathan Pritikin, you know, this uh, man that uh, changed uh, the whole emphasis from traditional medical care to these chronic diseases towards uh, a concept where the patient becomes involved, him or herself, with taking care of their own health by making lifestyle changes. And in my situation, it actually happened in 1970. Um, I, uh, I read an article called uh, 
valleys of beautiful widows. Uh, I mean, valleys of beautiful widows. Uh, that was very intriguing to me. And so I read the article and I was hooked on it. It talked about the idea that in Karelia, uh, on the eastern side of Finland, right next to the uh, Russian border, um, women were becoming widows at the age of 35, 40 years of age because their husbands at 35, 40, 50 years of age were already dying from heart attacks. It was the highest rate of heart disease in the world at the time. And these women now from these little villages were writing into the government of Finland and said, what can, what can you do to help us? We don't want to become widows here. Uh, send us some information, some education. Why is this happening to us? So they send a young uh, physician epidemiologist and he looked at the situation there and he said, look, uh, this heart disease is not related to uh, a lack of exercise because most of these men are lumberjacks. But what was actually then wrong with these people? Well, the habits, number one, they were smokers by and large. And number two, many of these people were following the typical Finnish diet. And as you know, in Finland, you have winters five, six, seven months of the year. And so it's difficult to get fruits and vegetables uh, and so on. So these people basically live on animal, animal products and a lot of dairy products and lots of cream, lots of fats and uh, lots of cholesterol, lots of eggs. And so they had cholesterol levels of 300, 320, 340 in those days. And so he said, we need to do something about the diet. We need to do something about the, the, the salt intake, which was very high too. And we need to do something about smoking. And so his medical colleagues kind of, uh, they kind of try to tolerate this young whippersnapper. Uh, they didn't have much um, respect for him because what does he know? I mean, diet has nothing to do with heart disease. It's the stress living next to Russia and couldn't be, we could be inv invaded anytime. That's the problem. Well, this young epidemiologist was determined to follow through on what he perceived was the right idea. He looked at the Framingham study that came out in those days and he said, we need to make some changes. And so he invited the, uh, the prominent leaders of these different villages, women, to come into a training center. He trained them, uh, he trained these women how to cook differently, simple foods, more fruits and vegetables, which he brought into the country then. He imported those and uh, they began to learn how to prepare foods in a different ways. They encouraged their husbands not to smoke. And, uh, you know, they were, you know, supportive of, uh, of their well being. And lo and behold, 25 years later, heart disease rates, the death rates from heart disease had dropped by 80%. <clears throat> Incredible. As a matter of fact, uh, today, Finland has one of the lowest rates of heart disease because Finland adopted the concepts which were learned and taught in Karelia, that little province there in uh, Finland. Uh, they began to teach this to all the people in Finland. And then uh, Karelia became a center of training countries around the world of how to make changes in harmony with better health. So this was a big... Uh, wake up for, for me, I was waiting to get to medical school. And I began to realize that maybe there is a relationship between diet and health. And being an Adventist, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a Christian person that is uh, Bible oriented, uh, um, the Adventists have always had a very strong uh, orientation towards uh, a simple diet, the way God designed it, foods as grown. And so that sort of made sense to me. And I began to shift from medicine to public health. And they just started at that time a doctoral program in health science with an emphasis on lifestyle medicine and nutrition. And that was it. I joined the program and changed everything. That's fascinating. You know, I recently interviewed on the show Dan Buettner, uh, the author of The Blue Zones. And what I think is so interesting about Loma Linda is he mentions that in the other four Blue Zones, they all drink alcohol. But Loma Linda, that's not one of the factors. That's true. Um, as a matter of fact, um, alcohol was kind of considered to be something you don't utilize, a little bit just like caffeine. Uh, well, maybe there's some secularization taking place. Maybe uh, uh, coffee has made its inroad now into the Adventist communities too. And uh, here and there, people begin to think of maybe alcohol is not so bad. So, but by and large, the traditional Adventist position has been stay away, stay away from uh, any uh, foods, any substances that can be 
uh, health erosive, such as smoking and alcohol and maybe, you know, the caffeine and so on. Yeah. You published some research too throughout your chip career, haven't you? Yeah, I have. But, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> so this Karelia, this uh, story about uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Valley of Beautiful Widows um, got me into the School of Public Health and to the doctoral program. And there I began to see the data that we began to understand about migrant studies. They looked at Japanese people. Japan in those days had very, very low heart rate, heart disease rates. <clears throat> they were on a very, very low fat diet, basically plant food based. And these Japanese had virtually no heart disease. They come to Hawaii, they come to Los Angeles, to San Francisco, and 20 years later, they have the same rates of heart disease and Western diseases as the people that live here. So it became a very powerful um, point of documentation that uh, it's not the genetics that apparently seems to protect the Japanese because otherwise they should have not had these diseases here in America, right, the Japanese. So uh, furthermore, uh, we began to become more aware of the various uh, uh, experiments with monkeys. Uh, they showed uh, that when you take monkeys uh, and you put them on a typical American hospital diet, guess what happens? They get sick and fat like everybody else. Two years later, the monkeys will have died of massive heart attacks, very close to uh, the heart attacks that you find in humans. So these were some of the, uh, the, the documentation that became more and more uh, prevalent um, uh, in, in those days. They also talked about what happened in Norway when the uh, Nazis uh, occupied Norway uh, they took all the uh, livestock uh, foods, they took all the, uh, the animals, uh, they took all the cheese, the dairy products, they took everything they could to feed their armies. And in the process, the Norwegian population itself had to live on very, very simple foods. As a matter of fact, they had to grow most of their foods in their own gardens. And guess what happened next? In spite of the stress of the war, heart disease rates dropped precipitously, uh, diabetes, there wasn't that much there to start with, but it came down. Cancer rates came down. Uh, and they began to realize that there was something here that was happening that in spite of the war and the occupation by a foreign country, uh, the, the people became healthier. And of course, then people said, well, who knows why that is? Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, the answer then came 10 years later as the Norwegian people began to eat again as they used to eat in pre-war times heart disease came up, cancer rates came up, diabetes rates came up, overweight came up, and they began to realize this was not a genetic problem. This has to do with how people live. And so these then were all very, very um, important documentations uh, to make the case that there's a relationship between diet and disease. Well, then there was one more study that really captured my interest. And that was a study by uh, a Dr. Lester Morrison Dr. Morrison was a physician in the Los Angeles area. And uh, he had uh, 100 heart disease patients enrolled in 1946 in a very special experiment. Half of these people, that is 50 of these 100, all heart disease patients would receive a very simple diet, foods as grown, eat simple foods, eat the food that comes in nature, don't eat the meats and so on. And the other group, he said, well, whatever you're doing, keep it up, uh, you know, uh, we have some medication that will take care of you. And then 12 years later, 1958, the results came out. In 1958, Lester Morrison published the results that all in the control group on the triple American diet had died by that time. But on the other hand, out of the 50 people that followed the simple diet, 38% of these people were still alive. That means 17 people were still doing very, very well. And of course, that was a very, very uh, big uh, uh, evidence again, that there is a relationship between diet and disease. <clears throat> you actually worked with Nathan Pritikin, didn't you, at some point? I did. That must I have did. been fantastic. I would have loved to have met him. What, what, what did you do? Did you work at one of the Pritikin centers? 
Well, I tell you, it's a long story in a way. Um, when I was offered a position there, I didn't want to go. I mean, this man was wacky. I mean, this man was not a physician. He was not a doctor. Uh, he was uh, an engineer and he claimed that he could reverse heart disease. He could reverse diabetes. I mean, it was just a fantasy world. He was a swindler. I knew it. He was just trying to make money uh, uh, off people uh, whom he promised the world and he couldn't deliver it. And so I didn't really want to go. And then some of my graduate students, uh, they came to me and they said, uh, I was teaching at the university here. And they said, uh, what about this predicate thing? We see all these report reports. He can reverse chronic disease. I said, oh, forget it. He's not a physician. He's just a charlatan. He's just an, a swindler. But you know, graduate students can be very nasty. When you don't give them good answers, they come back at you and they say, sir, we are not so sure. Have you really checked this out? Have you seen this man? Have you gone to Santa Barbara? Why don't you drive out there and give us a report? So I did. And I became a change man. I asked Nathan Pritikin, and I said, uh, I'd be very interested in taking a look at some of the uh, interest that you have in doing some of the research here and documenting this. Um, have you done some research so far? He said, no. Uh, I said, I saw reports uh, where you claim that you have 80% success with hypertensives. Well, he said, I don't really know. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a guess. So I knew that that was not very, very kosher, right? As a scientist, you say it's 89.1% or 61.3%. But this one said, well, it's about 80%. So then he said to me, well, why don't you come? Why don't you take a look here? Um, uh, why don't you come here in the summertime when you have uh, your time off and uh, bring some researchers with you and go through our records and take a look what we have? I did. And three months later, I gave him the report. And I said, sir, you are not right. It isn't 80% of the hypertensives that are off the medication and no more tensive again. No, no, no. It's not 80%. It's 83.1%, sir. And so I was convinced and I began to talk to the people there in that center. He had opened up a center in 1975 and um, he um, uh, had me take a look at some of these people. Uh, and I was totally shocked. Diabetics within two weeks would have to lower their insulin injections because their blood sugars would come down so fast and so quickly. People with high blood pressure, as I mentioned to you already, blood pressure levels came down, medication had to be redrawn, otherwise it would be dangerous to keeping these people on these very, very low blood pressure levels. And then, uh, you know, we saw people with angina pain, chest pain. The chest pain was diminishing within two to three to four weeks. And I said, how is that possible? You cannot change the narrowed arteries in, 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 in a few weeks. That takes a year or so probably. And uh, so um, I uh, began to talk to him a little bit more. And he said, you know, uh, have you heard of Lester Morrison, the physician in Los Angeles? I said, yeah, I, I read that report. Well, he said, I saw him uh, when I was 42 years of age. That several years ago, he said, uh, I saw him there in 1958 and uh, he uh, checked me out and he said, sir, you have serious heart disease. You have coronary insufficiency. You have heart disease and uh, I have nothing to offer you except we just had the study coming out here where we had people that changed their diet. 17 out of 50 people were still alive after 12 years. And while the others uh, who were on the control program all had passed away, would you be willing to do this? Well, pretty good. Said, yeah, of course. My doctors have told me that you cannot change cholesterol. Oh, he said. Morrison said, no, 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 no. Look, our people went from 300 down to 150, 160, 170 in just a few weeks, and they maintained it there. You can do it, but you have to make a change in your diet. You have to break the love affair with this American rich diet. You have to move towards foods as grown, simple foods that come out of the hand of a master designer, the way nature designed it. And Nathan was willing to do that. 
As a matter of fact, he also began to uh, look into these studies in Norway and he began to become a very uh, avid reader uh, of all the epidemiology and population studies around the world. And he began to believe that you needed to use the uh, simple diet of populations where you could not find heart disease. And so that's what he did. And uh, he, um, he himself uh, became very much uh, committed to this idea. Uh, he walked every day. Uh, his physicians had warned him, don't walk, because in those days when you had heart disease, you would not walk. You would just get into a rocking chair and put a consent, rocking chair, lots of motion, no progress. Uh-uh, it's not for me. I want to do something. I want to. And so he began a walking program with his wife and uh, he became so strong that the longer he walked and the more he followed this kind of dietary program, the healthier he got. And yet his physicians had told him that if you don't have meat, <clears throat> if you don't have bed rest, <clears throat> we cannot have you as a patient anymore. And so Pritikin was very, very successful. People watched him. Uh, <clears throat> He uh, opened up his center and it wasn't very long when 60 Minutes became interested in doing an expose of this charlatan because he was really um, blackmailed by the American Heart Association, by the American Medical Association. I mean, he was hounded. The dietitians had no use for him. I mean, he was just uh, uh, an outsider, okay? He was not accepted at all. And yet Pritikin, when he opened up his center, the people would come from all over the world. And they had similar consistent results. Blood pressure's coming down, cholesterol levels dropped 23% on average, which means that if you drop your cholesterol by 1%, you drop your heart disease risk by two and a half percent. That means if you drop it by 23% times two and a half, right? That means you cut your heart attack risk in half in just four weeks by changing your cholesterol. But there was more than that. He looked at the, uh, we looked at the blood pressure numbers and 83% of the patients that came in with medication as high blood pressure patients no longer were on medication after four weeks and their blood pressures were normal. And then we looked at the diabetics and here again, there were 409 diabetics that we looked at <clears throat> And 71% um, of these patients on pills coming into the program were off the medications in less than four weeks. And from those, I mean, of these people, there were um, quite a few were on, uh, on uh, insulin injections, right? I mean, this is serious diabetes. Again, here, 39% of these patients who had to inject themselves every day, several times with insulin injections no longer need of insulin because their blood sugars had come down so low, it would be dangerous to keep them on these medications. So we begin to realize that maybe the diet is more powerful than those medications that people take and there are no side effects. It doesn't cost you anything, right? And then moreover, uh, we looked at the angina patients and there were 51 angina patients that we very carefully examined and um, followed up on. And, uh, Within four weeks of these 51 angina patients, 31 no longer had chest pain, angina pain, because somehow the blood consistency, the blood viscosity, the thickness of the blood changes very quickly in one, two, three weeks. And if the blood gets thinner, it can get through these narrowed arteries to the heart muscle, and it can bring the oxygenated blood to the heart muscle, and therefore you no longer have the lack of oxygen, which causes the pain. So this was really becoming very self-evident after a while. And it's, these were some of the best years of my life. Professionally speaking, it was just absolutely wonderful. I tell you, uh, one of the patients that we had there was a lady by the name of Frances Greger. Frances Greger, she came in. No, she didn't come in. She was wheeled in, in a wheelchair. She came from the East Coast. The doctors had given her, because of severe angina pain and claudication affecting her legs, they'd given her a few months to live and that was it. But she heard of this industrial, this engineer, this Nathan Pritikin, and she said, I want to live. I want to get out there. 
So they flew her out there in a wheelchair. They wheeled her into the center there. She was right there. She was one of the people that I took care of. And four weeks later, this lady, Frances Greger, walks out without crutches, without wheelchair, and she's flying home. And uh, she, of course, is the grandmother of, you know who it is? Dr. Michael Greger. Dr. Michael Greger. Yeah. And Dr. Greger gets so excited. I mean, he is, he is a grandson. He, he gets into medical school and he tells his grandma, I want to become a pretty good doctor. I want to do what he did for you. And you know, Francis Greger, his grandmother, that was given several months to live, lived another 31 years, dying at 96 years. Imagine. You know, when you, see these kind of people, when you see these kind of people, then you realize this is what medicine was supposed to be accomplishing, right? And that's what we all wanted to do. We wanted to help people turn the diseases around. And we can do some wonderful things in medicine when it comes to infectious diseases. Although we're kind of hardly pre hard pressed right now with the virus. Uh, but uh, what, what we uh, have found is that when it comes to these chronic diseases like heart disease, and cancer, most of them, and diabetes type two, and high blood pressure, and arthritis. I mean, we have nothing really to offer that is really working to turn these diseases around. We can make people more comfortable. We can take some of the pain off for a while, but we don't really cure the disease, but you can cure the disease if you're prepared to make some changes. And that means you educate, educate, educate. You inspire, you inspire, you inspire. You motivate people to make the changes once they understand what they can do and that they will succeed. And that's what actually happened with Pritikin. Pritikin has had over 150,000 people coming through his program. It still is running very, very well. Uh, Pritikin himself passed away when he was about 69. Um, uh, when they did the autopsy, uh, they found that this man who had heart disease uh, some 27 years earlier, when they opened him up, at the request of his wife, the widow, they were absolutely amazed that there were none of these expected clogged arteries to the heart or to the leg or anywhere. And the report in the New England Journal of Medicine stated, here's a man, 69 years of age, who followed for the last 20 some years, a very simple dietary program and exercise the absence of atherosclerotic disease, narrowing of the arteries to this man's heart is a most remarkable finding. So, you know, it's very interesting that Nathan Pritikin kind of in his own death had to prove that he was right. You know, there were all these naysayers, all the medical people that were very, very uneasy about this man. As a matter of fact, when I was there, they sent one of the key men from the National Institutes of Health to come from Washington, D.C., from Bethesda to Santa Barbara, and they wanted to double check. They wanted to uh, really document uh, the, uh, the uh, danger uh, that this man represented uh, because they all knew that if you don't have meat, you're going to have anemia and iron, iron deficiency, when you don't have meat, you will have protein deficiency. When you don't have dairy products, you will have uh, uh, calcium problems. You will have osteoporosis. And this man was doing just the opposite. And they were all stunned when they looked at some of the results, when they interviewed the people there. And so Pritikin really uh, became the father of this revolution that then began to settle in called lifestyle medicine, where we began to realize that you have to empower people to make some of the dietary changes, the lifestyle changes, so that the body can begin to heal itself because that was the purpose. That's how the body was designed somehow to, to clean out itself. And so if you stand by and you uh, endorse and enhance and implement the self cleansing of the body, you will have some unusual benefits taking over. You are so popular. Somebody just really wants to talk to you, don't they? Dr. Deal, that is so interesting what you said about how Nathan Pritikin almost had to die to prove that he was right. It sort of reminds me of how when they did the autopsy on Dr. Atkins, the opposite uh -oh. happened. Uh-oh. 
Well, I don't know. Did they do the autopsy or they didn't want to have the autopsy done because they weren't quite sure what they would find. And so they didn't do the autopsy because it was self-protective. They didn't want to know what may be inside of the arteries because he was pushing a lot of animal products and the more fat, the better you are. And da, 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 da. you know, it's, yeah, yeah, you're right. Atkins was just the opposite. And yet people still believe what he said today. And now we have probably even worse diets than Atkins. We've got the keto diet, we've got the carnivore diet. So it seems like in some ways things haven't changed very much. It's true. And you know, that's in spite of the 60 minute report that came out. You know, when I was out there in, in, in Santa Barbara with Pritikin, uh 60 minutes, the television series called. So we like to come in and do an expose on what you're doing there. So they came and they said, uh, but we want to have total control of this project. We want to do the research the way we want to do it. And Pritikin said, well, it's all yours. So they brought their own cardiologist. The 60 Minutes cardiologist selected the three patients that were at the Pritikin Center at the time. Of the many, many patients, they selected three heart disease patients. And uh, they did all the uh, assessment of their blood chemistry and so on. They filmed everything and then 60 minutes left. And they came back, they came back three weeks later and they said, uh, we wanna come back after three weeks and see if these people are still alive. Will these heart disease patients still be alive? And what are these blood cholesterol levels look like? What about their cholesterol and their triglycerides and their blood pressures and their diabetes and so on and so forth. So the report came out, 60 minutes. And it was the most viewed 60 minutes program in the history of 60 minutes until that time, because everybody got interested in turning diseases around as they documented in 60 minutes by looking at the longevity center of Pritikin's in Santa Barbara. That's what made Pritikin famous. That's why everybody talked about Pritikin. Pritikin wrote six books and he became the founder of this whole movement of lifestyle medicine. We are in a new era. You know, all the people like Esselstein and Ornish and, uh, and Barnard and, and, and myself, all of us, and McDougall, we all owe a great debt to this engineer who looked at disease differently from the medical profession because he looked at the cause. And if there's a cause, how do you find the solution? Not just, you know, covering it up, putting a Band-Aid on, making you feel better, no. We need to find the cause. And once we have the cause, we need to find the solution to it. That's what Pritikin's approach was. Is there a way for anyone to see that famous 60 Minutes episode? Is it available online somewhere? Because that sounds like it would be very interesting. I have it in my, in my archives. It's, it's, a, it's a film this big. <laughs> Remember this? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it would be really interesting, wouldn't it? Those I know you have, you have that gentleman, Daryl, that helps you out. I bet you there would be a way to, that we could see that because I think that would be fascinating. I think you're absolutely right. <clears throat> so it was been some very, very uh, exciting times for me to be there as a young health scientist and then to in due time, seeing over 120 scientific reports published in peer review medical journals by top researchers that he hired from UCLA documenting over and over again the incredible uh, uh, benefits that the body uh, generates by being uh, given a chance to, uh, to heal itself. So Pritikin has done some incredible work and the people at the Lifestyle Medicine, let me call it, no, at the uh, Pritikin Longevity Center in Miami, uh, they're still doing an outstanding work there where people come from all over the world to find uh, relief and understanding for the disease. They come for two to three to four weeks. But that was also for me the reason <clears throat> after a while that I thought that I needed to make some changes in terms of my professional career because I, uh, coming from a fairly humble background in Germany after World War II, um, I, uh, I wanted to see people getting well regardless of their financial ability to come into a beautiful spa right? I'm sure it's a very, very good investment, <clears throat> but not everybody could perhaps make that investment. And so I also began to wonder, uh, once you leave the center, the protective environment of the center, where everything is done for you, 
how long will the new lifestyle last? Especially when you have a, a health uh, adversive environment where everybody says, eat, drink, and be merry, and don't worry about anything. The doctors will take care of you. We got all the medications for you. Don't worry about it. Enjoy life. I wondered what could I do? And I recognized that maybe I, have to, I had to take this critical concept on the road, so to speak, and uh, maybe change the whole town, change the culture, uh, transform the society by creating more understanding and awareness through education. And so that's, that's actually what happened. That's amazing. What was the food like at the Pritikin Center? Was it all you can eat? And what, what, what did it, was it delicious like at the McDougal program or at True North? Well, Pritikin had some interesting ideas. He believed that people should eat six meals a day. Wow. They're, they were very, very simple foods. There was nothing really that fancy. It was very, um, very Spartan actually. Um, so I think, you know, it was a major taste shift for most people, but these people wanted to get healthy and they were willing to make the uh, adjustment uh, in terms of that taste. And so when, when I began to think about this, uh, that was a time when I had a friend, a physician friend calling me up from Canada and he said, can you come here? We have a small town, 4,000 people. Can you give the annual preventive medicine lecture for the people? I said, really? What's this all about? And he said, well, a physician that was very well um, respected here passed away and he left some money and he determined in his uh, last will that some of the money should be used every year to give a lecture for the people in the town to give them better health. So I said to my friend, so you want to have me come, give them a lecture, and then you expect them to become healthier people? Yeah. No. I said, no, 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 no. If you want to have healthier people, you don't give them one lecture that only antagonizes them. If you want to really have healthier people, you have to change the habits. And this physician asked me, well, how do you change habits? You mean like food and exercise, no smoking, eight hours of sleep, becoming nicer people. How do you do this? I said, well, you have to do something that you want to become as a habit. You have to do it for 21 days every day. After 21 days, it becomes part of you. And I said to him, just think about this. If you're left-handed and you're brushing your teeth with the left hand, I want you to start brushing your teeth with your right hand. Do you think you can do it? No. He said, I probably can't even find my, 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 my lips. It's such a strange feeling if you've never done this before. I said, okay, but you do it. You do it for 21 days and you become ambidextrous. You probably can do it with both hands. Hmm. So he said, 21 days. So you won't come up here to give the lecture? I said, no, I have two kids, I have a wife. And it doesn't make any difference to me. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything in terms of the health of the people. But he said, if I invite you to come for 21 days, would you come for 21 days and give a lecture every night for two hours? Would there be something that you'd be interested in? I said, well, I have to talk to Lily about that. So I talked to Lily, my wife, and she said, well, you know, you're so driven to, to do this and you've seen the success at the Pritikin Center there and you wanna make it available to the common person as well as everybody else, why don't you do it? So I called up my friend and I said, I'm coming, but give me six months to get all my ducks in a row. I have to do my slides and everything else. Um, I'd be very, very interested in, in, in working with you there. Well, before I got to this little town of Creston in British Columbia, before I got there, the word was already out. You wouldn't believe it, Chef AJ. Everybody in town knew that there was this charlatan coming from Loma Linda. He was kind of a, he was not a real doctor. When it's true, I'm not an MD. I'm a doctor of health science, right? He's not a doctor. He is just trying to steal our money. These Americans coming in, Big Brother is taking over, taking the, the money out of Canada. 
And so when I, when I arrived there, um, uh, the newspapers had already uh, written up all these articles about me to warn the people. And unfortunately, many of the physicians there of the town had talked to the newspaper and said, look, you know, there's this American coming in. Uh, he's not a physician and he's making all kinds of claims. He tells people that they can reverse heart disease, that they can change their diabetes, that they can eat more and lose weight. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, this is a one day fly. They come in and they go, but we are here to serve the people forever. And so the newspaper was very, very supportive of uh, the efforts of the health professionals. I'm sure they were very, very uh, sincere about their understanding. And they, they didn't possibly know very much about the diet disease relationship as I didn't. And so they were determined to get me out of town. Well, when I realized the uh, opposition to my being there, I said to the uh, newspaper editor, look, I'm going to give three information sessions. I tell people what I'm going to be doing so that they can have a pretty good idea what's coming up and they can make a very informed choice if they want to spend a little bit of money. It wasn't much really, but to, to cover the expenses and have a bit of extra, they can make an intelligent choice. And so with all the negative publicity there, the first time around, they only had 25 people showing up. So again, the next day there was bad publicity about uh, you know these claims that this uh, um, so-called doctor made from California. And then the next lecture that I gave, we had 250 people there. And the third lecture that I gave, the same lecture three times, was now we had 400 people signing up for the program. And out of 400, I mean, think about this, out of 4,000 adults in that small town, 400 came into the CHIP program and they could now understand the cause and the cure of many of these so-called modern killer diseases such as heart disease and arthritis and diabetes and hypertension. It was really something. And uh, you know, the word spread like wildfire to the neighboring town. And before I knew it, there were 1,500 people signed up for my next program in the neighboring town. From there, I went to another town called Kelowna, 2,000 people signed up. I mean, it was just... And then finally, I ended up in Ottawa because the government now wanted to know, how does this thing really work? And we signed 250 people, like many of them government officials. And they saw for themselves that when you take the blood pressure before the program and after the program, the cholesterol before the program and after the program, the angina presence before and after the program, when you measure the people before their weight and after weight, the, the results are there. They were almost as good as the Pritikin program where people spend money for coming into a beautiful spa and live there for three to four weeks. I would just go to the places and I would live there. And then, you know, my wife, one time she said, uh, you know, I, I really need to sit down with you and talk to you. She's a very sweet lady. But when she talks that way, I know that something is very important happening. I was prepared. And she said, you know, honey, you know, I don't know. Do you realize that you have here a very lonesome lover? Do you know that you're married? Do you know that you have two children here that I'm taking care of while you are saving the world? How can we find a solution where you can do what you feel called to do and yet you're still also being my special friend, my loving, my husband and the father of my children? It really was like a stab in my heart. I love this girl. an Asian, beautiful, accomplished lady. It really hurt me very deeply. And so when I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, <clears throat> I was doing another program. You see, every time I do a program, it takes three months. One month to enroll the people, one month to run the program, one month to, you know, to clean up, to take the data. So when I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, I had 900 people signed up. The, the uh, local hospital had brought them in and they hired me to do a CHIP program 
three chip programs there in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And then I got the idea. One night, I looked through the yellow pages. Do you remember yellow pages? <laughs> <laughs> we would go through them like this. Yeah. And I looked up videography. I looked up videographers. And I found a, a listing there and I call up these people and I said, do you do videos? Yes. Can you come to the hospital and do uh, shoot some videos? Uh, I'm giving some lectures there. And they said, are you the doctor that we have read in the papers about? I said, yes. Oh, we really uh, feel very strongly that we want to help you um, because you have a mission that we identify with. Oh, that was great. So uh, they said, uh, what do you want me to, what, what do you want us to do? I said, well, I'll just come in and, 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 and to take the, uh, do the video uh, videos of what I'm doing there. And they said, well, sir, do you need three or four cameras? I didn't know. I didn't know. I said, well, tell me. Well, he said, uh, you need one on yourself, one on the slides, one on the audience. You need at least three, maybe four cameras to really make it very interesting. Okay. Then they asked me, uh, uh, is, uh, do you want us to do the post-production as well? I didn't know. I had no idea. I, I was a green one in this field. And he said, well, obviously you need to have something uh, where you have post-production done as well. And um, um, we would be interested in working with you to help you with this when you have your next trip program. So that night I thought to myself, what am I getting involved in with here? I mean, I had some business training you should at least get three bids, right? Right? So I called him back the next morning and I said, sir, um, um, I wanted to double check uh, what price could you offer me for those 16 lectures and they're two hours long and you use three or four cameras and you do post-production as well. What would you charge for this? And he said, well, remember, we give you half price. So that was good. And as then I said, uh, but tell me a little bit about uh, the quality that you produce. Uh, I, I have not seen your work. Uh, can you give me some ideas of, uh, do you have some references that I can call about your work? Well, he said, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we are the official videographers of Bob Hope. Bob Hope. I mean, he was the famous humorous comedian. They would travel to all of our armed forces around the world. Bob Hope, I mean, Bob Hope, no more questions. And so I hired these people and uh, they did a very, very nice job. And from that time on, all of my lectures of the video programs have now been uh, available to facilitators whom we train, who then take these programs around the world uh, and uh, use them to um, help transform local society like we've done in Rockford. Well, of course, I should tell you about this, uh, uh, AJ. <clears throat> Rockford is near uh, Chicago. And uh, <clears throat> remember, I had uh, uh, promised my wife that uh, everything would be on videos now and I would be more at home and she was very happy with that. And the kids were happy and everything was just really right on target. And then a hospital called me in uh, Rockford. We would like you to come and do a major program for us here. And I said, well, we have videos. And they said, have these videos been validated? Have you checked out whether the videos are as effective as when you do it in person? I said, no. Well, they said then, we, we, we don't feel comfortable in bringing videos in. So I uh, got back to my wife and I said, honey, on my knees, one more time. I need to go to Rockford when, this time. One more time I need to go out in the field. We have to really, really um, uh, validate the value of these slide, of these uh, videos. And so she was very gracious and said, well, yeah, go ahead. We can wait one more time. So we ran the program in person, results before and after. 
we then used the videos with a new group of people, 300 people before and after the results were taken and the results were actually comparable between the two programs, whether it was done in person or by video, the results were consistently the same. And uh, so as a result, we had some 3000 plus participants in the Rockford CHIP program. We had 27 restaurants that came to us and they said, we want to offer CHIP menus. Uh, we are prepared to offer at least five CHIP approved menus, low in salt, low in fat, low in sugar, all the things that you sort of talk about, Chef AJ, right? Uh, but maybe you go a step further than what we can do in the community at large. And so uh, it became a big, big success. Uh, uh, when we came to the town, there was only one uh, soya uh, milk, a milk substitute there on the shelf. When we left town three years later, there were 39 brands, non-dairy brands as milk substitutes on the shelves because many of the, uh, our black friends recognized that many of their um, indigestive problems were related to, they were not very, very comfortable with these wheat uh, milk products, right? Yes. So, and, and milk became, and cheese became kind of uh, something that people began to realize was not really in your best interest in terms of heart disease and atherosclerosis and so on and so forth. And so since then, we have published over 50 scientific reports in medical journals. We have close to 100,000 chip participants. And uh, when you think about it, it all started in 1970 when I happened to read an article entitled Valleys of Beautiful Widows. When I became acquainted with Lester Morrison and his work in Los Angeles, when I finally began to work with Nathan Pritikin and my eyes were opened widely that we are in charge of our health, healthy by choice, not healthy by chance. I love that. I love what you said about um, the, the dairy because I recently interviewed Dr. Milton Mills for the GI Health Summit and he talked about that how the, the guidelines are they're so they're so biased and that most people actually can't even digest milk. Correct. Correct. Especially certain uh, uh, groups, ethnic groups, they have very difficulty with this. Yeah. So you can do the chip program now, right? I mean, it, it, even with the pandemic, are, are they, are some people doing it online? Yeah. I talked this morning to uh, British Virgin Islands. That's a small group of islands uh, out there in the Caribbean. And uh, they have bought into the uh, CHIP concept. The government has uh, adopted the CHIP program and makes it available now to the population that is encouraged to participate in the CHIP program to do something about the epidemic of heart disease and obesity and diabetes in these kind of areas. And so, I was just delighted to talk to some of the government officials this morning and who are very, very grateful that uh, CHIP came and is there and uh, it's gonna be expanding. So I feel very, very uh, happy. I feel very professionally uh, uh, gratified that somehow I could make a small contribution with my life uh, after being inspired by Nathan Pritikin, an engineer, right? to show people that you can turn these diseases around. You don't have to have heart disease. You don't have to have a diabetes. You don't have to remain a diabetic. You don't have to remain a heart disease patient. You don't have to remain arthritic. In most cases, you can turn this thing around in that the body oftentimes begins to heal itself and succeeds. I mean, it's a glorious message. And of course, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there's now um, an American College of Lifestyle Medicine. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine uh, is certifying physicians in a specialty of lifestyle medicine. It is the fastest growing uh, medicine, uh, medical specialty today in America. It has branched out into 42 countries now where they teach lifestyle medicine concepts, nutrition, 
uh, how to deal, deal more successful with stress, how to get enough sleep, how to do something about smoking, all these kind of habits that drive these modern chronic diseases. And the CHIP program very recently became the only one and the first one certified by the American College of Life and Medicine to be offered as a fully recognized program. So, I mean, this is sort of uh, uh, the crowning point for 35 years that I've been working in this field of lifestyle medicine and uh, the Lifestyle Medicine Institute. And it's a very wonderful crowning point for me. And sharing that with your group is a, a special, special occasion because you are very much appreciated my wife and I, we really appreciate what you're doing on a daily basis in trying to get the message out to the people. You don't have to be overweight. You don't have to be a binge eater. You don't have to live the way you do. You can make some changes and we'll help you, right? Absolutely. You know, we have somebody watching live that is a chip facilitator, but she says she hasn't used it. She's go in, uh, let me find it. Her name is Kim. And she said that she got the training, but she's not doing anything with it. And I said, this would be a great time to, to start doing something with it. A tra yeah. a train ship, she says, Kim says, I am a train ship program facilitator 2017, but I have not used it. I'm interested in refreshing my skills and working with groups. How, how would somebody go about that? Please call on Chef AJ and Chef AJ will give you my number. And then you can call me and I will try to build a little fire under you so that you get on it. Interested? Fantastic. That's the best time for you as a therapeutically oriented person that's reaching out to helping people is coming to you as you take a closer look at what CHIP can offer you. Nice. I just want to read some nice comments, Dr. Deal. Dr. Gerald Woodruff says, a remarkable story, a remarkable person. Great interview. He's talking to, about you. Rose says, what a humble doctor. So grateful for his passion. And Barbara says, we appreciate you so much for your numerous contributions. A glorious message. So people really like you, Dr. Deal, <laughs> as do I. Well, thank you very much. I, I, you know, I took the CHIP program in 2010 along with my husband and, and a gal who was working with us at the time, and it was fabulous. And it has even made further uh, strides towards sophistication, everything else, because in 2012, a brand new video series was filmed with uh, additional speakers, not just myself, but also some other speakers that really eclipse my ability to speak. And so uh, this has been a fabulous program with new books, everything is just now one beautiful package and it's all available. So if there's anybody out there, feel free to call on uh, Chef AJ and she will give you my phone number. And also I can give you our website. Our website is, uh, our, can you give them the website? Uh, Absolutely. Chef? Isn't it chip, isn't it chiphealth.org or chip.org or something like that? Yeah, it's www.chip, C-H-I-P, health.com. Oh, dot com. Okay, there we and go. If you, if, you, if you do this and you go dot com slash optimal hyphen diet, optimal health slash, then you get six pages of how to get on the journey with CHIP. Right, and we'll, we'll, we'll put that in, not only in the chat box, but it's in the show notes. So people that oh, will good. be seeing, yeah, because people, not everybody, a lot of people will be seeing this broadcast yeah, afterwards course, yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah. That will give you some uh, introduction to the CHIP program. Yeah, it must be very gratifying to have helped the large numbers of people you have. Well, it's a very humbling experience. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know when I left Germany at the age of 18 that I would someday speak in English to people on the Chef AJ show and on many other national broadcasts. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you're great on those shows. I really love the one with you and Dr. McDougal. <laughs> and people can actually see that. You can still access some of those shows. Yes. A lot of fun. You can also go to our <laughs> www.chiphealth.com website and you can check out Ask Dr. Sell 
and you'll find many half an hour seminars that are all available to you at no cost. Absolutely. I was on one, you were on one and, and, yes. uh, and he does it every Wednesday live at noon. And that's actually, you know, as mentioned, I watched it yesterday because a lot of your graduates were giving their success stories, which is perfect for this time of year when so many people are giving up because of all the, even if they're not, you know, traveling, there's just so much more unhealthy food around right now that's available. True, true, true. Yeah. Well, that well, has been a wonderful journey in uh, not only meeting you and seeing your mission and uh, service uh, ministry that you have developed over time in such a generous manner that it's sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I speak somewhere and people say, you know, Chef AJ? I said, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, you know, we feel uh, it, it, we are in, in, in a bond of committed to making life a little bit better for people that have come in touch with us, isn't it? And yes. that's the greatest joy for me. And I'm sure it's for you too. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Deal. And you know who the guest is tomorrow? We have some other Loma Linda doctors. The Shares Eyes are the guests tomorrow. Oh, they're wonderful. Be sure you give them my regards. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, their ch- one of their children took piano lessons from my wife many years ago. Wow, that's incredible. What a small yeah. world. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And you know who's going to be on soon is, is a gentleman who is now my personal lifestyle medicine doctor, my personal doctor, Dr. Wayne Dysinger. Oh, you are hitting the jackpot. Absolutely. He's going to be on towards the end of the year. Well, He's thank my you. my neighbor. Oh, my God. You're so lucky. That's right. That's right. That's right. He's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Deal. I so enjoyed talking to you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. As Dr. Deal said, you must come back tomorrow because I'm having both Dr. Shazai's on. Thanks so much, Dr. Deal. You take care. Bye-bye.